She gets these songs from. You've got some good ones. Amen. Well, folks, we'll study the Bible a few minutes tonight. If you have your Bible, turn to God, the Gospel of John, chapter 1. John 1 and verse 1. Father, I pray now, Lord, that you anoint this messenger and give me understanding in the Word of God. And Father, bless your word as it goes forth. It will not return void. In thy holy name I pray. Amen. All right. Verse 1, John 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. And the Word was God. Amen. You can be seated. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John make the four Gospels. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called synoptic Gospels. Synopsis, a one view. The Gospel of John's always been understood to be different. It doesn't fit as a synoptic gospel. I believe the Gospel of John was the last gospel written. I believe the Gospel of John was the last book of the canon of Scripture written before the book of Revelation. Revelation closed the canon of Scripture. Revelation and John written by the same man, written by the Apostle John. The book of John is very important, very, very important, because it takes you out of the Jewish kingdom and the earthly ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ to the Jewish people and projects you into the future among the Gentiles and Jews, anyone that will hear the gospel. The book of John, if you'll notice, if you've read it and paid special attention, doesn't say a word about the church. The word church is not to found in the gospel of John. The word church is not found in 1 John. 2nd and 3rd has church, but not 1 John. Why? Because the gospel of John is about personal salvation. We'll say, preachers, the church is not wrong. Yes, the church is definitely. Jesus Christ said, upon this rock I build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. You see, here's the problem. Men are trying to build the church. John wants to point the fact out that if you'll preach Christ, he'll build his church. That's the issue. If I be lifted up from the earth, I'll draw all men unto me. It's not my place to build a church. My place to preach the gospel. The Holy Ghost will build his church. And this is why the gospel of John focuses upon one issue, and that is who is the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why it's so important, because the biggest mistake you'll ever make in your life is to not rightly understand who the Lord Jesus Christ is. You ask the average man today, and he'll give a half a dozen different things about who he is. Great teacher, great sage, leader of a religion, showed us the way, this, that, so forth and so on. The Lord Jesus Christ, folks, is God Almighty, manifest in flesh. John chapter number 1, verse number 1, the Lord Jesus Christ is presented as the Eternal One. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. God and the Word are one and the same. This, this is emphasizing his eternity. Chapter number 2 and verse number 4, the Gospel of John, says that, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. This focuses upon the ministry of Christ, how that he made himself subject unto his mother, unto his mother, even though he now is a grown man, he still allowed himself to be subject to her because the, the declaration of his ministry was yet to come. In its fullness. So he said, woman, what have I to do with thee? Look at verse number 25, John chapter number 2. And needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. And if you notice, John says that this is the beginning of miracles. See, we have a progression through the gospel of John. It's very important to understand that progression. For John, like the book of Revelation, opens up for you who Christ is, and how his ministry relates to us. Look at John chapter number 3. This has to do with his uniqueness. John chapter number 3, verse number 18. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. This is unique. He's the only begotten Son of God. That's a different study in itself. I've been begotten of God. Begotten means to be born of God. But this is a begetting that is unique, unlike any, any, anything else. Look at chapter number 4 and verse number 10. Now the writer of the Gospel of John gets into his superiority. He wants to compare him with others. John chapter number 4 and verse number 10. 
Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, showing that she was ignorant of true salvation, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest ask of him, and he would have given thee living water. Look at verse number 22. Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of what? The Jews, showing you that the Messiah must come through Israel. See this? This is his uniqueness. All nations do not have a Savior. And all, and all religions do not produce a Savior. There is one name given under heaven whereby we must be saved. And that's the Lord Jesus Christ and He alone. And He came from the Jewish people. So the Apostle John is showing you his superiority over Samaria or over Gentiles. John chapter number 5 and verse number 6. Look at this scripture. Watch how he continues to unfold this now. John 5, verse number 6. When Jesus saw him lie, knew he'd been now a long time in that case, he saith unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? This is his availability. He's available. The question is not whether Christ can do it. The question is, not, is whether you want him to do it. Wilt thou be made whole? Wilt thou be saved? Christ is the Savior of all mankind. Do you want a Savior? This is how he's being presented to you. This is what it's about. He's pointing you in the direction of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Gospel of John, all 22 chapters, are about Christ, Christ, Christ. It's all about him. So his availability. Notice that it's the house of, house of Bethesda is where this was happening. And the house of Bethesda means house of mercy. But this man had received anything but mercy until the merciful one showed up. Mercy now is no longer in a house. Mercy's in a person. See, I say this over and over and over again. It's not a place you go to to be saved. It's a person you receive to be saved. So in John chapter number 6 and verse number 32, watch this progression now. John 6 verse number 32. John chapter number 6 and verse number 32. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. Hold on. Now he's calling Moses out. You see, he's talking about Moses. You have to understand how highly esteemed Moses still is in the sight of the Jewish people. So what he's about to do is to show you the superiority of Christ over Moses. John chapter number 6 and verse number 32. Look at carefully again now. Moses gave you not that bread from heaven. Plain words, Moses can only take you so far. Right? You remember when Moses could see the promised land? From the north to the south, but he could not enter into the promised land. Moses can only take you so far. Now, Moses is a man of God. Moses is legit from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet. Moses was God's man at God's time, in God's place, and nothing derogatory to be said about Moses. But Moses could only take you so far. And this is why the Apostle John now is calling your attention to Moses and Christ. And he's comparing the two. And Christ is obviously superior to Moses. Look at chapter number 7 and verse number 22. John chapter number 7. <clears throat> in verse number 22. Now here we go with Moses again. Moses therefore gave unto you circumcision. Now watch the way he defines this and clarifies it. Circumcision did not start with Moses. But it was an issue with Moses. And it was a sign of the law. Moses therefore gave unto you circumcision. Not because it is of Moses. But of the fathers. Where? Where did it originate? It came from Abraham. And ye on the Sabbath day circumcise a man. Now watch this. Here we have Moses. And Moses brought up again. It has to do with circumcision and it has to do with the day. All right. Moses, as I said, can only take you so far. Moses can't, Moses can't get you saved when you have Christ. Moses took them as far as the law could take them in the Old Testament. And that was to convince them and convict them. But it could never save them. It forced them to admit that they were lost without God and without hope. And they had to turn to Jehovah in mercy through the priesthood and the offering of a sacrifice. <clears throat> so here in John chapter number 
7 and verse number 22, he said circumcision, Moses. Now look at verse number 38. John chapter number 7 and verse number 38. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Moses has confined you to a day. This is what's going on here in John chapter number 7. You're all tied up with a day. You're tied up with a Sabbath day. Right? But the Lord Jesus Christ is the Lord of the Sabbath. In plain words, He's the Lord over the Sabbath. In plain words, He gave the Sabbath. And the giver is certainly greater than the gift. Right? The blesser is greater than the one being blessed. Abraham was blessed by Melchizedek. Why? Because Melchizedek was greater than Abraham. Hebrews chapter number 7. So now we have the superiority of Christ over Moses <coughs> because Moses is confined to a day. These people couldn't get past the day. Look at chapter number 8. Now we have Moses again. John chapter number 8 and verse number 5. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou, boy? In plain words, we've got the word of God, Moses and the prophets. Now who are you? What are you going to say about that? So Christ now is being compared to Moses when it comes to the, what? The law. Look at chapter number 8 and verse number 12. Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Look at verse number 23. And he said unto them, Ye are from beneath, I am from above. Ye are of this world, I am not of this world. Boy! So what's going on here, preacher? Well, the law condemned. So Moses under the law, what could he do with an adulteress but what? Condemn her. Moses could only take you so far. And Christ in his superiority over Moses said, Look, I am the light of the world. And when he wrote in the dirt, boy, did he ever turn the light on. And when he turned that light on, they all saw themselves for what they truly were. And we'll talk about light here in a moment. And when the light comes on, you ever go walking? When I was a kid, we walked into the kitchen and turned the light on, the roach bugs start running into the corner. That's how I grew up. <laughs> They'd run from the light. That's exactly what a man does when the light gets turned on. Let me tell you something. The most uncomfortable person in the world is the Lord Jesus Christ to an unsaved man who's trying to hide in his sin. Christ is the light of the world. And he, now I'm telling you, religion won't do the job, but Christ will. So the superiority of the Lord Jesus Christ has been firmly established over Moses. Now we've got one more name that we have to deal with. John chapter number 8, verse number 33. Then answered him, We be Abraham's seed, and were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? Now they are appealing to their bloodline. Moses is the father of their religion. Abraham is the father of their seed. Moses is the father of their religion, their book. Abraham is their spiritual father. This is what they're appealing to. They're saying, we're not in bondage to sin. Abraham is our father. And there's nothing you can say about Abraham. He's the friend of God. Abraham, for his time and his place and who he was and where God used him, none better on this earth than Abraham. Same with Moses. You can't say one thing against these men. But I'm comparing them to Christ Meditate on that for a moment. <laughs> Meditate on that. What do you think I would look like compared to Christ? Do you want to be compared to the Lord Jesus? <laughs> no, you don't. Because He's the sinless, perfect Son of God. Look how He compares Himself to Abraham. John chapter number 8, verse number 37. I know ye are Abraham's seed. But you seek to kill me, because my word hath no place in you. Look carefully now. I speak that which I have seen with my father, 
and you do that which you have seen with your father. Then answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. Jesus saith unto them, If ye were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. But now ye seek to kill me, a man that hath told you the truth, which I have heard of God. This did not Abraham. Boy, look at verse number 53. Art thou greater than our father Abraham, which is dead? And the prophets are dead? Whom makest thou thyself? Boy, are they mad. Verse 58. Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. Yes, he's superior to Abraham. He's superior to Moses. He's superior to John the Baptist. He's superior to the Apostle John. He's superior to me. And he's superior to you. The Lord Jesus is superior to all. He has given him a name above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. And now he's introduced to you as the great I Am. Put that in the back of your mind and turn to John chapter number 9. John 9. Now we come to his essence. This is his essence. Now we've showed his superiority over Moses and his superiority over Abraham. Now we're going to come to the essence of the Son of God. Who is he? Who is this man? John nine thirty five. Jesus heard they'd cast him out. And when he'd found him, he said to him, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? These are the words that came from Christ. He answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe? And Jesus said unto him, Thou hast both seen him, and it is he that talketh with thee. Here we go. Now we've risen. We've done the comparison with humanity. Now what's left? The highest place there can be. This is it. I am the Son of God. That's what he said right here. Did he not? Of course he did. And if your Bible doesn't say that, throw it in the garbage can and get you a real Bible. Amen. Say, that's mean, preacher. You need a real Bible. And if, and if they strip him of his deity in John 9, you've got a piece of garbage in your hands. He said, Thou hast both seen him, and it is he that talketh with thee. He is God. Now the ninth chapter of John is one of the most important chapters in all the Bible. Let that settle in for a moment. Say, so why do you say that, preacher? Because of what goes on in John 9. It is one of the most important chapters in the whole Bible. Notice it starts out with a man that is born blind. All right, this man is a type of Israel. They're born blind. The Jews are blinded. They're blinded to the truth. Remember that the gospel of John is about the light, the light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. A blind man cannot see light. Light, Christ is light. See, he's the light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Light, word light, shows up more in John than any book in the Bible. Even some of those big books in the Old Testament that are much longer the Gospel of John has the word light in it more times than any other book in the Bible. Why? Because it's emphasizing the light. Now look how it works here in John chapter number 9. The blindness is connected to a curse. The blind man, you remember what happens to him? He made a spittle, Christ did. Took the mud, rubbed it on the man's eyes. Okay? And he said, now go wash in the pool of Siloam. The pool of Siloam is a pool of water that came up out of the ground. And filled it up. And then it was a place where they would go and they would have rituals constantly. Because the pool of Siloam went back in ancient Israel, Israeli history. But here's what's important. The word Siloam, <clears throat> as it's interpreted, told you what it means. It means scent. Scent. Now think about this. The word scent shows up more in the book of John than any other book in the Bible. The word believe shows up more in John than any other book in the Bible. Light, believe, and scent. That's three of them. In plainer words, the book of John is emphasizing something. The first time the word scent shows up, look over here in John chapter number 1. John chapter number 1. And verse number 6. John 1, 6. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. Now, what, which John is this? Baptist, right. This is not the apostle that wrote the book. This is John the Baptist. Now, 
the word sent right here, a man sent from God, that Greek word is apostello. That's where we get our word apostle. You see, the word apostle means sent, one that is sent. In plainer words, John the Baptist had been given a commission. He was sent from God. Like the waters of Siloam or the waters of Shiloh or the waters of, of the pool of Siloam are the waters that are sent. Notice, they come with a commission. They're here for a purpose. They fill this pool for a reason. Now, notice sent is used again here. John chapter number 1 and verse number 8. John 1, 8. Same man. Now, look at this. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. This word is hina. It's a different word entirely. Now, in English, it's same sent, sent. But if you look at the text, it is hina. And here's what it means. It means in order that or with a purpose. See? He is a commissioned apostle with a purpose. See how it works? The apostles that were chosen, handpicked by Christ, were sent ones. In other words, somebody had a purpose, somebody had a reason, somebody had a, had a plan to send them. Sent them out. So this water that was sent, that came, that came up out of the ground at the pool of Siloam was there for a reason. See? So the Lord makes a spittle, makes mud. He reaches down and takes a handful of the curse because the earth is cursed. He rubs that curse on the eye of a blind man. His blindness is spiritual blindness. He's a type of it. Spiritual blindness that Israel needs to have this removed. So here he is with this mud, the curse, on his eye. He goes down to the pool of Siloam. He reaches in there and he takes a hold of a hand of that and he washes his eyes. And when he does, he washes the curse away and he comes seeing. So you take the analogy and apply it to the Jews. The Jews think they see, but they don't see because they've rejected Christ who's the light of the world, right? But if they had accepted him, he's the sent one for the word sent shows up over and over and over and over and over again in the Gospel of John. If they had accepted him, he would have washed the religious blindness from their eyes and they would have been able to see. That's the message of John chapter number 9. But they refused it. There is no blindness on this earth greater than spiritual blindness when you choose to be blind. John chapter number 3, verse 18. This is the condemnation that light has come into the world, but men love darkness rather than light. See it? And that's the way God thinks. Light rejected is the greatest damnation that will come upon any soul on the face of this earth. This is why John wrote the whole gospel. He said, I wrote this book so you will be able to see that Christ, the Lord Jesus, is the Son of God, and that you will believe on Him, and believing you'll have life through His name. Fifty-two times the word believe shows up in the gospel of John, far and away more than any other book in the Bible. So we have the word light, we have the word sent, and we have the word believe. Now there are others, but these are three that I want to emphasize for you tonight. He's the light of the world. The word phos is the Greek word translated light, and it literally means to send forth in rays. How many of you have ever seen a, after a storm or after a rain, and you see the sun begin, you see the clouds begin to move back, but the clouds are there, and the light rays come down through the clouds, and you see the rays. Sometimes that's a beautiful sight, right? Well, the reason for that is because the clouds are up there and it's filtering and you see the rays. Well, that's what he's talking about. He said, I am the light of the world and you can see that light as it shines down upon mankind. Once it ever comes into your soul, it will drive the darkness away. The sad thing is that you have so many people who are so religious and they're dedicated to their church, but they're as unsaved as they can be. Notice. There's not a word in the Gospel of John about believing in your church. There's not a word in there about believing in a, in a, in a man-made catechism. Everything in the Gospel of John is about believing in a person. The Lord Jesus Christ. And if you will believe in that person, you become a member of the church. Immediately. 
Because you're a member of the body of Christ. And you cannot divorce the body of Christ from the church. And this is where I fell out with the Baptist brothers so hard you wouldn't believe man that ever fall out with them. For them to teach that a man could be saved and not be a member of the church. Because as far as they're concerned, the only body of Christ on this earth is a church of like faith and order is theirs. With one of their ministers and baptized the way they baptize and everybody else is excluded. You're friends of the bride out there, they say. But you're not part of the body of Christ. That's garbage. There's just one body of Christ. And if you're born again, you remember that body. If you're not, if you're not, uh, if they're, here, turn over here in the Ephesians. <laughs> I hadn't planned on doing this, but we didn't do it anyway. Y'all won't get mad, will you? Ephesians chapter number 4. Verse 4. There is one body and one spirit, even as you're all called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. So when we finish up with the Gospel of John... We are so encouraged in the simple fact that the last book of the Bible before the last book of the Bible is a book that is directed toward anybody, Jew or Gentile, rich, poor, bond free. Makes no difference who you are. This book is written that you might believe. Look at John chapter number 20 and verse number 31. Told you why I wrote it. John 20, verse 31. These things, these are written, but these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the Mashiach, the Son of God. You got that from John 9, didn't you? You remember? I that speak to thee am he, and that believing you might have life through his name. There's belief and light there in John chapter number 20, verse number 31. There is no kingdom of heaven in the gospel of John. The kingdom of God is mentioned in John chapter number 3, clearly as a spiritual kingdom. Nicodemus, you must be born again, or you'll never even be able to see the kingdom of God. You can't enter it except by a new birth. Remember, John is the only gospel that mentions the new birth. And there is another apostle, another one of the apostles that mentioned the new birth. You know who it is? What? Peter. Being born again, not of corruptible, but of incorruptible, by the word of God that liveth and abideth forever. Peter wrote that. Being born again. In other words, the new birth. The, the Apostle Peter wrote that. Now, I don't know. Your speculation, you can speculate until you turn blue in the face. I believe that holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. I believe that. I believe that when these words were written, they were written under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. I do. I believe that fallible men, capable of error, but incapable of error when they were writing... They're not perfect men, but under the leadership and the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, when they put pen to paper, it is, it is impossible for them to make an error. That's inspiration. Theos Neustos. God breathed upon that His living Word. And this is why you've got John. Now, now here's the situation. You know, East Tennessee, folks have heard the gospel for so many times. It's, it's not funny. But believe it or not, there's a lot of people around here that have never heard it. Isn't that sad? Here, right here in the, in the buckle of the Bible belt. <laughs> they've never heard the gospel. That's really sad. It really is. That's sad. If you want to take somebody to the gospel, if you want it spelled out for you in the Bible, the man said the other day, he said, he said, Lawson is not preaching flat earth, so he's not preaching the gospel. Turn to 1 Corinthians 15. Here's what the Bible says. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1. And I'll close with this tonight. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel 
which I preached unto you, which ye also have received, and wherein you stand. By which also you are saved, ye keep in memory what I preached to you, unless ye believed in vain. Now watch this. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. Here we go. How that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures. And that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures. And then follows as a witness that He was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that, He was seen of above five hundred brethren at once. There's not a word in here about being baptized. Not a word in here about being about joining the church. There's not a word in here about uh, what kind of life you live. If you're born again, you're going to live the right kind of life. It's just like if you're born again, you're going to be a member of the church. You see what I mean? You, I forget what the term would be for that, but first things first. Christ will build His church every time a soul is born again. He's building it. Amen. He's building it. And you are a member of that body. So that's the gospel. So what is the gospel? Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. He was buried. And He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Death, burial, resurrection of Christ. That's the simple gospel. Now there's a whole lot more issues involved. But that is the simple gospel. That will get you saved. If you believe that, and believe it in your heart and accept it, God will save your soul. That's what John's talking about in his gospel. He's the Son of God. Bless His righteous name tonight. Thank you, Lord, for coming to me when I was lost and blind and ignorant. Thank you. In thy holy name I pray, Lord. Amen.